we want to explore how we can blend best of blockchain with best of open source. And we have organized a rock star genius panel to help us understand what exactly does it mean to be open source and what can blockchain ecosystems learn to help move themselves forward. And our rock star panel includes Johnny Nguyen from IOG. He will moderate our genius panelists. He'll be joined alongside Santiago Carmoega from TX Pipe. Arno Bailey with IOG, and Matthias Bencourt. Please give our panelists a huge round of applause. Well, hello, Lusan. How's everybody doing today? You guys ready to talk about open source? We've got an amazing panel up here. And um, you know, I'll, maybe I'll kick things off and uh, do a round of introductions. Why don't we start, go, uh, start with you, Santiago? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Santiago Carmoega. I'm based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm a software developer. I've been developing software for, I think, almost 20 years now. And a year ago, I started this project called TXPipe which is a company that develops open source tooling for developers working in Cardano. Awesome, thank you. Arno? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Arno Bailly. I'm um, working at IOG. Um, currently um, as a, a new capacity in the head of architecture for Cardano. And I was, uh, before that, involved in the, I was the ar architect for the Hydra and Midfield projects. And I've been uh, developing software for way too much. <laughs> I guess, and uh, yeah, I've been in open source and discovered open source uh, in the late 90s, and since then I've been dabbling into it, so yeah. That's awesome, thank you. Matthias? And um, Matthias, I am technical director at the CF today. I've been a core contributor to different open source projects, including Hydra or Hognos, uh, I've co-created the CIP process also about four years ago, I think, and been a CIP editors, authors, and reviewers since there. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I'm Johnny Nguyen. I'm a director at IOG. Uh, I'm a passionate about open source. And uh, for the better part of the past year, I've uh, woken up every morning thinking about how to build a members-based organization. And so, and we launched that yesterday as part of the Age of Voltaire. And if you're interested, go and sign up at cardanombo.org. So let's get started with the questions, guys. Typically, when I ask someone about what it, open source means, and they don't, they've never been a part of the open source community, they usually tell me something about source code, the license, and the repo. And totally logical, makes sense, because source is in the name. Uh, but one of my mentors uh, in open source, Dirk Hondel, uh, really helped me understand and appreciate the role of the community in open source. And while the community, I think, is very important, I've grown to appreciate the community's role in all of this, I want to take it back even a step further to where it really starts, and that's usually with someone trying to scratch their own itch. So, Matthias, as a software developer, what does it mean for you to scratch your own itch? Sorry, to what? Scratch what is it <laughs> to scratch your own itch, right? Um, sorry, I'm not sure to get the question. <laughs> well, developers usually are just solving their own problem, yeah. right? And if their solution doesn't exist, they're just going to go out and build it themselves. Yeah, okay. Right, a euphemism for that is to refer to that as a developer scratching their own itch. Okay, I see what you mean, yeah. yeah. So, well, as, as developers, we are in this situation where we build software and tools, but we also use software and tools to build them. So there is often this temptation to build your own stuff. And that's pretty much how many open source projects get started in the first place. You have a particular need, and you're either unhappy with the solution that exists, or you want to build your own solutions because there is none. So you just start doing it. Uh, to fill your own problem, and rapidly you discover that there are other people with the same problem as you, and they 
might be also interested in the solution you've built and you know contribute to it and that's how you sort of get started to explore solutions like that and yeah get the ball rolling on on open source projects yeah and so it's amazing to think that from somebody like Linus Torvalds scratching their own itch and creating an operating system so many years ago today we have such a vibrant ecosystem similarly with Cardano started with Charles's vision, and today we have this amazing, vibrant ecosystem. But I want to bring it back, Arno, to that notion of community. And in many ways, people describe open source as a social contract between you and your community. What is the social contract between Cardano and the Cardano code base and the engineering team behind Cardano and the community? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> I would say that really the short contract is to build, um, um, I think, the, from the small space, which I'm aware of, which is really the, the core stuff that we are building, the Kalem node, the Hydra layer two solutions, uh, Mithril engine. I think we are really building, uh, yeah, building blocks, uh, or the, the core engine of the system. And our the short contract we have is, we have a duty to build something which is uh, secure, uh, which provides the, the highest performance, which is really uh, like, you know, this, this, this idea of having this engine humming and buzzing, and it, it flawlessly works for years. And Cardano, in this respect, is really an achievement. I mean, I'm, I'm just, we, we, we are standing on the shoulder of giants who, break, who, who build this thing in a way which is very robust. And, um, but we also have the duty, I think, to, um, to make it easy for other people, to make it um, approachable, to make it easy for other people to build on it. On it. And that's really the thing which uh, we are, we are, we are uh, 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 really striving for now, is make it more approachable, make it more open, and make sure that, and the social contract is really to say, hey, we are building something which is, we are taking into account uh, the, the, the wish and desires and the, the goals and the, the myriad things that can be built on, on that, that people want to do on it. Um, and in counterparty, we are, we are really putting long and hard and generating effort and, and thoughts. And, but on the, 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 the counterparty is that we are making it very transparent. We are making that the decisions we make or technical decisions we take are really very transparent, very obvious, and say, yeah, we, we, did, we did that way because X, Y, Z, and now you can potentially argue around it, but it becomes a technical argumentation. And then some, some so it's, it's really like, a, yeah, it goes both ways, I would say. So there is a, a contract of transparency versus responsibility in terms of making the best of uh, the best code you can make. Yeah, it's really amazing when you think about Cardano as a platform and protocol. In many ways, I think of maybe Steve Jobs when he created iPhone probably never could have imagined the vibrant application ecosystem and the accessories ecosystem that we have today. But in order to get to where they're at, you know, they had to build a lot of tooling around that. And so that's a good question for, for you, Santiago, because it, in a lot of ways, if Cardano is this platform and protocol that doesn't really envision what's gonna be built on top of it, you really anticipate the needs of developers trying to build on Cardano, and you build a lot of tools and solutions for them. Um, why don't you tell us what are some of the challenges or some of the nuances that most developers that are new to Cardano that or non-developers maybe have a, a hard time appreciating about some of the uh, idiosyncrasies of building on Cardano? Yes, well, I think that um, developers, when they approach Cardano, they are faced with a very hard onboarding process that uh, makes sense because it's a new technology, it's innovation all over the place. The UTXO model, it's something that developers need to understand and maybe they are not familiar with that coming from other ecosystems. And also, we need to understand that working with blockchain is harder than working with other technologies. Sometimes we, as developers, think that the newest technology means uh, more developer friendly and I don't think that's the case for blockchain. We should understand that blockchain is trying to fix a social issue, and by that we need to implement more complex technology. And uh, developers, when they get into the 
uh, Web3 sphere, um, they are faced with that. So they have a very uh, steep learning curve that they have to go through. And I believe that our focus, if we want to uh, promote adoption, should be on developer experience. We should try to lower the entry barrier so that we get more developers and more the apps, and that will finally bring end users to the system. Yeah, and I certainly have to applaud you for the documentation and the landing pages that you have on all of the projects on TX Pipe. In particular, I wanted to focus for a second on uh, URA. The name of this tool is inspired by the tail command available in Unix. Yeah. I love that a lot of projects, kind of like Ogmios, is inspired by uh, Ogmios, the Celtic god deity of uh, eloquence, right? And I think that these are there's a lot of cheekiness with uh, project founders always, and they find ways to kind of embed Easter eggs and things. But you say that to, to uh, the URA is based on the Unix tail command, and Cardano's consensus protocol, protocol Ouroboros, is a reference to the ancient symbol depicting a serpent or a dragon eating its own tail. So URA is literally ancient Greek word for tail. You describe URA as the tail of Cardano. Can you tell us a little bit about the approach you've taken with TX Pipe? Both take data off the chain and do something, uh, oh, I'm sorry, compare it also with uh, perhaps CARP, because both solutions take data off the chain and do something with it. What are some of the similarities and differences? Yeah, sure. Um, Aura started, as you were saying before, uh, by trying to scratch my own itch yeah. uh, when I first approached uh, Cardano as a technology, um, I needed a way to uh, extract real-time real -time data yeah. from the chain, and I didn't have anything um, simple that I could use out of the box, and that gave birth to uh, Aura. Um, the idea is that we tend to think of blockchain as a database, and that's the wrong approach. I think that we should try to uh, approach it in a more event-driven way, uh, thinking that uh, the ledger is just something live that generates events and consumes events. And Aura tries to be a tool that allows you to connect that blockchain into event-driven stream processing tools such as uh, Kafka, another open source uh, tool, and um, any kind of uh, queue processing uh, technology that we have there. The idea is that it's plug and play. Now, uh, compared to Corp, um, the goal is a little bit different, I believe. Uh, Aura tries just to uh, connect a stream of events. CARP tries to provide an efficient way um, to describe the state of the ledger in a relational model. Uh, and both use cases are valid and complementary. I believe that you can use Aura to react to uh, things that happen, and you can use CARP to check the state of the ledger, current and historical. And build an index on it. Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, Matthias used to work at IO, and you know his webcam never used to work, and so his picture on his um, uh, on his uh, Google Meet stuff would always be just the face of a yellow duck, and similarly on Twitter. So it's good to finally see uh, Matthias and see that he's got legs beneath that duck head. Um, Matthias, everybody I've ever spoken to talks about you and describes you as somebody who's really passionate about open source. Where does that passion come from and what do you attribute it to? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I think it goes back to very much the first time I started really doing programming. I, I like started very early in my life, like around 10, 11 years old. And I got into programming and you know, computer science through resources available on the internet. Right? So there was a lot of free resources, free documentation, or just sometimes blog posts that people would put out and you know, take a weekend to describe an entire tutorial or process. And that's sort of how you get to learn. Then I followed you know, engineering school and did the normal standard path for that. But when I started professionally writing code, I just thought that's the only way to write code. Right? And 
from I think day one, the first project that it was open source, and I always looked for a mission that had a focus on open source as well. Because to me, it is important. It's, it's, it's how we build software in general. They have to be open source. That's the, the only way, the only sane way to build software is to collaborate, to contribute, and to keep this growing. And I think that's why IT today and, and software development has so much grown in the past years. And why we, we could take projects like Linux, right? And, and take them to different scale. It was because they were open source from the start and because people could contribute. So it just comes from, I guess, my experience with the software development, and I kind of replicated that. Um, and also, you know, put my own sauce in it, right? Try to, to, to make it my own. And, and, and uh, after years, you start mastering a bit the codes of open source, what it means for something to be open source, what you would expect also yourself from a, an open source project. And now when I do a project, I try to put in them everything I would like to see on another project. Because I put myself always as a user, a consumer of those things, and I'm always thinking, what would I like to, to see on a project? What kind of documentation would I you know, like to have? How would I want to use that tool to install that tool? And, and so forth, and I just make it happen for my projects, and usually it makes people happy. Yeah, so would you say in some ways there's even a little bit of overhead from doing things in a more open way, but that the uh, <coughs> ROI or the, or the reward for doing it the right way, the open way the first time, is just worth it? It is, it is, and I'm always thinking if, if everything was like that, if all the software were really you know, carefully crafted and that people put as much effort in open source as they could, then we would be, you know, have a much pleasant time in developing software also and consuming any existing solutions really that exist. So it, it's a little bit of effort, but the, what you gain also in return is also not only people that use your software and gives you feedback, but also if you make things right, contributors that are willing to join you on your mission and that wants to you know, help make your own software better because they have also their own ideas and their own needs that you have maybe not foreseen in the first place. So making, making the room uh, welcoming enough that people can join and help you on the task, that's an effort, but definitely worth taking. Thank you. So Arnaud, kind of building on that point a little bit, um, Cardano today is already licensed under an Apache license. It's already in a public repo. And you could argue in many ways it's already open source. There's already a lot of contributors and people looking at the Cardano code base. It's got about, I, last I checked, about what, 7,000 GitHub stars? Um, but you know, as we discussed, a big part of open source is the community. And if I was an aspiring developer, passionate about Cardano, wanting to kind of learn the code base, I know it's a little bit challenging because of the years of embedded design decisions and everything in there. What would be a good entry point? Uh, kind of um, where could somebody start if they wanted to navigate their way around the Cardano code base? That's a, yeah, another good question. <coughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't preach and I know everything there is to know about the Cardano code base, but um, yeah, I think the thing with open source is that the, 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 code, uh, the code doesn't lie, right? That's the thing, you have the code uh, at your disposal. So I would say one of the things that, uh, one of the good entry points at the end of the day is really to start uh, unbundling the thing and starting look at, looking at the code. So probably a good entry point, if somebody is an engineer today and wants to get into, uh, okay, I'm, 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 I, have an, I have an interest in blockchain technology, I want to yeah, start a career or start hacking on stuff and maybe build a tool on top of it. Um, probably, uh, yeah, s s tools like, uh, Cardano Node is, is, it would be the first, the first entry point, obviously, the, the Cardano Node repository. Uh, there are quite a, few, quite a lot of docs uh, out there that people can find. Uh, on the on the Calendar Foundation website, but um, the, the truth is that yeah, um, most of the time it's 
it's easier to approach the, 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 the Cardano, the existing, the core of the, of the system to, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe tools like Ognos, I would say, is a good, is a good entry point because it's, it exposes, Ognos exposes a lot of the uh, details of, the, of the, the, the system in a way which is more approachable. And then later on, de delve into the, the, the intricate details of the, there is a node, there is a consensus, there is a network, each of those part I, quite tricky, and of course there is the, the ledger. Um, yeah, it's uh, one of the things that we are currently, uh, I, mean, I think as, as, as a community and as, as a team, uh, the team I am working with is trying to also to make it, as you say, more approachable. It, it's not as approachable as it should be, uh, as, it, as it could be and uh, as it should be, and so I think we, we are also trying to, 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 to improve in that respect so that this question should be answered pr very easily. Yeah, yeah this, the entry point is there. Just go to the repository, stop there. So, so if I understand what you're saying partly is that, um, you know, there is a lot of advanced embedded protocol, computer science that goes into the development of core Cardano, Cardano node. And perhaps maybe a better approach and, and one that I've certainly benefited from my programming engineering journey is to kind of poke and prod around the outside of that thing. Yeah treat it like a black box, you know, push some buttons, pull some levers. And perhaps in that regard, Santiago, you know, going back to the tools exposed by uh, TX Pipe Team, whether it's Demeter, uh, Palace, or um, Ura, perhaps how could some of those projects be used to help onboard a new developer wanting to play with and build on or tinker with Cardano? Yeah, so I think that the best way, if you want to get into Cardano as a developer is first to try to integrate something. Uh, not try to get into the weeds of the core components, but rather see what you can do with the data, see what you can do by building transactions, and maybe start on the outside, as you were mentioning. Um, people think, or at least in my experience when I talk to developers, um, we tend to think that uh, developing blockchain means developing smart contracts. But actually, if you look at the code bases out there, if you want to build at the app, the off-chain components, the front end, the integration layer, uh, it's, uh, in terms of size, it's much more code than what you end up building for the smart contract. Um, so I would say that if you want to uh, start uh, your journey in Cardano or in the blockchain ecosystem, you should start from there, from the outside. See if you can integrate some kind of uh, front end, some kind of uh, indexer on top of the data, some kind of uh, transaction builder that you can use to send uh, data. And if you see the list of uh, tools that we have in TX Pipe, they tend to be uh, those kind of uh, components, components that integrate. Uh, so I think that's the, the best way to approach it. Awesome. Um, Matthias, when we talk about um, kind of getting started, the often used analogy in software engineering or programming or hacking around is your typical hello world example. What would you recommend to somebody as a hello world in Cardano? Well, I would typically recommend multiple hello worlds, starting from each era of Cardano and following that up. Right. So you start with Byron and you try to make a simple payment. Because that's basically all that was available in the Byron era. It was very simple, you get you know, an input, an output that gets you to acknowledge to the UTXO model, to the node, how it works, and everything you will use to construct your transaction, submit it, observe it, it's, you can reuse that across all the other eras after that. And once you've done that first step, you can move into the second era, which is Shelly. And in Chile, you've got introduction of delegation, rewards, and a bit more complicated stuff. You can start playing with that. Then you go to Allegra, where you have you know, native scripts that were introduced, and this little l degrees of programmability on chain. You can start playing with that too. Then you move to Mary. Mary was the multi-asset UTXO, where like, you can start minting your you know, own tokens, play with that, have a UTXO that contains bundles of different assets. Then you move to Alonzo, where you have the Bluetooth contract that get introduced, and you know, so on to now we have um, the Babbage era and, and fo following up. But I think the eras themselves, they are very good 
tutorial kind of steps to follow because they gradually introduce you different features in the Cardano ecosystem. And they are still present on the blockchain because of how Cardano is built, right? Cardano is this succession of eras that gets more and more complicated and features, upgrades get added. So the basic stuff is make a payment, make a transaction, because everything is about a transaction in the end. Right? From delegation to interacting with the contract, you always end up building and submitting a transaction. But you can gradually make it more and more complex and sort of get accustomed to all those new features until you master it all in the end. That's awesome. Um, so when we talk about open source, a big challenge with open source is sustainability, maintainer burnout, and sometimes toxicity of the community. Can you tell us a little bit about, I know this is an open question to anybody that wants to answer it. Um, what are some of the ways that you try to nurture and build and support your community and monitor for maintainer burnout? Mm, I have an idea. <laughs> it's still in the works. Um, but I think that the uh, main component of an open source project is the governance aspect of it. And there are different uh, ways. Uh, they are identified even. Uh, there is the benevolent dictator, one person that decides what gets merged, what are the priorities. You can get uh, also an, an alternative is to have a steering committee, some board that takes those decisions. And the one that we are trying out in TX Pipe, it's uh, usually called duocracy in the sense that um, the people that make uh, the work, the people that are putting the effort in the code base are the ones that decide uh, the roadmap and the priorities and what gets merged. Uh, so I think that helps with uh, maintainer's burnout because uh, it fluctuates from one group of people to the other depending on uh, the uh, moment of the year and it also has a sense of fulfillment because uh, um, there's nothing like doing code for stuff that you know that it's going to uh, make sense. Sometimes you end up uh, uh, understanding that it doesn't, but many times the process is more fulfilling if you're doing, uh, uh, if you're trying to achieve the goals that you set yourself. Anybody else? Yeah, um, I think there is um, one of the things that I think is important, as you say, that this community aspect, it's, I think we, we tend to think it's a given. We tend to think that, yeah, I mean, you know, you, 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 we talk and we, we are humans being and, and, and everything is fine. But in practice, uh, building a community and fostering a community and maintaining the community takes energy, time and skills, and especially in terms of communications. And I have a couple of exam exam concrete examples in mind in, in repositories I, I was involved with where, I mean, and we all have this kind of example in mind where, oh, somebody is, putting a, somebody is posting an issue and yeah, I mean, maybe the issue is not phrased in a way that's very, uh, I would say, welcoming or very, 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 very nice. And, and somebody starts to answer and this answer is kind of escalate, escalate on the issue and now you end up having people, you know, arguing and bickering. Sometimes over maybe technical stuff, but it, it's hard to get into a, a, a conversation where you're trying to get to the problem rather than trying to, uh, yeah, blame people or assign uh, be, being, being call, calling names. And that's something that needs to be worked on. And that's something that uh, maybe sometimes require concrete training. I mean, things like, I have a, co a good colleague of mine uh, who is really thinking that if, we, if more people would learn nonviolent communication uh, in open source community, then maybe that would help also foster better conversations. Because now when you start talking to someone, you start to try to get to the point where what's the problem really they're facing, not rather than, oh, the way they're expressing it. And making our, uh, we are, as developers, making also more aware of the others. Like, yeah, somebody has been, like Matthias had this, this example, somebody has been hacking on something for 10 hours and, and banging his or her head on the wall. And, and she finds that, or, or, that 
actually it's a problem in the code, it's a bug, and so yeah, she started frankly type something in an issue, and this issue is sent somewhere, and, and, and this issue will actually hurt someone deeply because that someone has been spending also hours and days in this feature and thought that it was fine. And we need to we need to improve that, and I think that's really something that that's the that's a danger uh, in, in, in in open source communities, which is really toxicity and. We all know, I guess, communities which are very toxic in that respect, and usually they don't last very long, or they end up, they end up being, being like sex. But, uh, but uh, I think I know in this respect, and from my experience, it's extremely, it's rather, yeah, on, on the upper end of the highest of the scale, it's very good. I mean, I, in the various projects uh, I've been involved with, uh, especially in Midfield, we have tried to really have this direct access and conversation with SPOs and people building on it. And as soon as you start to speak to people, and as soon as you start to be try to be transparent and explain, and t and I actually treat people like adults, usually it goes better. But it it requires time and energy, and uh, yeah, that, that that's something we we are, we are really trying to push inside the the various uh, repository and communities we are working with. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. To to, to add to that point, I am, you know, I'm, I'm quite active on Twitter and social media in general. And, and one thing I realize is you really get to attract people based on how you communicate and also, you know, that are kind of like-minded. So if, if you tend to be, you know, passive aggressive and a bit violent in your communication, the people that will be around your circles are likely going to be also communicating the same way. So many times it takes a lot on you to make sure you communicate properly so that you attract people that are, have also this similar mindset. And that's also true for open source, right? When someone opens an issue, when someone wants to discuss a problem with you, sometimes it's, you know, if you feel like you're going to give a reply that is maybe not the, you know, most gentle reply you could give because you are also, you, know, you have also your own stress, your own task, and sometimes an issue comes at the wrong time. Sometimes it's best to just you know, wait it a bit and come back later to it. And to be, on top of that, to be very, very transparent about what you expect from people and how you want people to interact with you on your, your project. So that's what most repository, most projects on, on the open source have a contribution guidelines that tells people you know, how you can open an issue, how you can interact, what kind of maybe delays you can expect in the answer, uh, how you should you know, formulate things. And, and this sort of, of, of details that makes it very transparent how you, you are going to communicate with people, how you, you expect them to communicate with you as well. And most of the time, really like most of the time, people that are willing to put efforts into collaborating and contributing to a project, they are, you know, they, they are well-intentioned. They want to do things well, and, and it's, it's usually pleasant interactions. It's quite rare that there is someone who is very frustrated and pissed off and that just sort of rants on, on a particular project. And when this happens, it's quite important to understand you know, why this happens and how you could maybe make it not happen by having extra instructions or by having maybe, I don't know, more examples, stuff like that. Or sometimes it's just you know, someone that is pissed off and you, know, you sort of ignore that and you move on. Yeah, sounds like um, in the open source world and just in life, general, we could all benefit from a little bit more empathy and compassion, right? And it sounds like it's not even just a matter of um, nonviolent communication or trying not to escalate things, but perhaps even actively trying to de-escalate things. Um, we did, in fact, observe some of that, and I, as you know, I'm also active on Twitter, and um, I see that part of the Twitter algorithm is designed to encourage engagement farming. And so people tend to take more polarizing takes or, dare I say, uh, shit posting, right, just to get a little bit more engagement farming out of that. Um, but whereas when you're actually working on trying to solve a problem, really it's about solving the problem. It's not about getting more engagement. And so trying to understand each other and finding the right words to reduce that level of toxicity is an important part of um, open source. So kind of with that, sometimes it helps I think to have this notion of uh, a code of conduct. Uh, what would you like to see included in a code of conduct if the uh, member-based organization's open source program office 
were to come up with a standardized um, code of conduct, or would you prefer that each project kind of have its own code of conduct? Yeah, I think it's tough to answer. Um, it's funny how open source started as a way of developing software, and now it has become uh, a social platform right. where maintainers are more like uh, content creators, and they need to curate the contributions of an audience, which are the contributors that just come and go, some stay and turn to be long-term maintainers, but others just are here for a small moment of time and they contribute on some specific thing and they just uh, continue with the next thing. So the, the actual job of the maintainers is to uh, be able to steer all those contributions, sometimes in large projects could be uh, hundreds of contributions. So um, I think that the code of conduct in any project should try to, um, to put that uh, dynamic express somehow, that if you're here for a specific thing, you should behave in a certain way, and that the maintainers have the technical skill to decide if that makes sense or not with the roadmap of the project, and that there is also um, a progression on what you can contribute to a project. Some, sometimes when you get into a large code base, I don't know, for example, let's say the React uh, open source project, uh, you get to start by contributing with documentation, or maybe if you found a bug, a specific typo somewhere, or a small bug, that's the entry point. And then you escalate with more complex things as you go along. So I think that to avoid issues and friction from the start, a code of conduct a contribution guideline should uh, describe that progression of how you start and where you can end if you put the effort on on the long term. Awesome. Uh, I think it's hard to, um, I think there are baselines and uh, in, in that respect, uh, having a code of conduct which, which provides, which provide baselines like, thing like, I mean, it can be summarized visually, be nice, right? It's mostly, it's mostly what it is. Be nice, be inclusive and don't, uh, don't deter people or don't, uh, consider people as adults and as good willing in the first place. I think there is a baseline. Whether or not there should be one code of conduct that's kind of uh, replicated, uh, or there should be a specific projects should have uh, their own code of conduct. I think most of the time, uh, having one is, uh, is fine, and then the, if there are specificities, the question is practically what it means to, a code of conduct is just a way of saying hey, we expect you to be up, or we expect everyone involved in that project to be up in some way. And most of the time that way is pretty obvious. It's it just a, an, an explicit, it's a, just a way to explicitly state something which should be implicit in everyone, but usually it's not. It's like, you don't har harass people, you don't, uh, you don't segregate people because of whatever gender, race, uh, orientation, uh, and, and any kind of other uh, thing like that. Um, and you are here also, we are all in the, in, the same, in the same boat. We are here to build something. And I think that's where things start to be a bit, I, I think there is a, I, I'd like the answer, but there is a question for the open source community that sometimes, as, as you mentioned, uh, the, the open source is, is, was meant for builders. People who are, they come for something, they, they scratch an itch, like you mentioned in the first question, is, and you, 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 scratch, you, you scratch an itch and say, oh, I'm looking at the internet, and I say, oh, this project isn't, looks interesting. Oh, but it's missing this feature. Mm, I'm, am I going to fork the project, create a new one, add a feature, and then, no, I now have the skills, so I'm going to contribute. And there is this thing like, you are here in an open source project to do something. It's not about, I mean, one of the things I, I, I kind of try to avoid is, you are not here as a consumer. You are, you are not, we, we are trying, I think in the open source communities, most of the time we are trying to get out of the consumer producer relationship, which is kind of very basic in our society. But open source is trying to, do, to not do that exactly. You are not a consumer, you are also a producer and you get what you put in the system, right? If you're, if you're. and so the cutoff conduct should probably find a way, and I don't know really how to do that. It's, it's not really contrib contributing is about the practicalities, but conduct is really about saying, hey, if you come here, 
here is, here is how we are expecting people to behave here. And contributing and being there to do something is important. It's not your, not the consumer. And I think that's a problem that which a lot of, I would say, large and public facing and consumer facing projects are facing. Like, sometimes you get issues about, hey, I can't, I, I can't, uh, I don't know, I, I can't spin up my node. Oh, but yeah, but if you, if you turn the power of the computer, that would be easier. I mean, I'm, I'm obvious, this is a ridiculous example, but this kind of thing, so, which, which, come, which, which has more to do with the usage and, and the fact that you are consuming an artifact which has been built by someone else than really doing something. And I think there is a fine line which, which uh, there is a threshold there that should be aware of. Awesome, thank you. Matthias, anything you want to add? Well, to be frank, not much to what Arno said. It's, it's really, there's a code of conduct is a way to transcribe something that should be obvious in the first place. Or well, maybe it's not obvious, but it is implicit, and you just want to make it clear how you expect people to behave. Um, and if I, if I wish to see one thing maybe in a code of conduct that would be, you know, do your best and assume that people are also doing their best. And it's usually true on the open source side, or from the interaction I've got, that, that's what it boils down to. And if, if you just follow these like kind of simple rules, it usually help a lot with interactions and making sure that you know, things happen in a nice way. Yeah. yeah, in a way it sounds like it's something that would make sense if you were standing around at a bar having a few drinks with friends and just coming up to some agreement on how should we behave. You could probably write it down, sleep on it, wake up the next morning and see if it still made sense, mm -hmm. right? Maybe we could take each other up on that tonight and come up with a code of conduct for the MBO. How about that? Yeah, yeah. and, and it's also something that is never really set in stone, right? Yeah. If at some point you discover that there are new interactions and maybe you need to review something, you can, and that's the yeah. magic of open source. Yeah, I mean, but it makes sense. Don't be a jerk, treat each other with kindness, right? Don't assume anything, and if you're not sure, ask, clarify, and try to de-escalate. And it's not, I mean, one thing that, it's not obvious in tech, especially because, I mean, there is also, you know, this kind of uh, idea of, the, I mean, the, the hero character or the fact that you are, you know, there is a ranking, right? People rank against each other whether or not they achieve this thing or they are, I mean, we have this kind of language wars and yeah. editors wars and, and, uh, and whatever wars and we keep, we keep trying to rank ourselves and compete again. And, I think one of the things maybe a conduit should enforce is we are, on it, we are not here to compete on this thing. We are here to collaborate on this thing. And collaboration is maybe a more, um, yeah, it's, it's a true collaboration. Collaboration exp means that you are exposing yourself and you are also agreeing that, yeah, I mean, I'm here to contribute. Maybe I'm not, I'm doing my best and everyone is doing his best, like Matt just said. And yeah, sometimes I make failures. And, uh, and, and we, we have also to be, aware that we, we fail sometimes and we make mistakes and we yeah. all do and that's that's okay yeah i appreciate that so we've got about a few minutes left here but i want to kind of give everybody a chance to answer one last question Let's fast forward um it's a year from now two years from now whatever where is the cardano's open source ecosystem where would you like to see it lightning round okay um I think that we should understand that source code, it's a liability. Uh, you need to maintain it, you need to upgrade it. Uh, the real asset is the process, how you develop the engineering team, the communication with the community, the back and forth of contributors. So uh, I would like to see Cardano with focus on that process. That should be our uh, main priority. Absolutely. Personally, I would like to See more, more uh, external, more contributors contributing to the core of Cardano as much as possible. And ideally, yeah, one, two, three, four years from now, people coming from GX5 or, or from an anywhere saying, hey, I got a PR against the consensus because I found some way to do it better. Or I got a PR against the network layer because there is some, you know, some, some Twitch or whatever. That would be awesome, I think. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's, it's really seeing more people joining, sort of getting overwhelmed by everything that's happening on the open source ecosystem because it's you know, getting very big, big and big. 
And I, I think I wish to see more, maybe, different implementation of different you know, core components that exist to force a collaboration on you know, standardization on interfaces, to see more people even contributing to the CIP process as well, have you know, discussions around that with more reviewers, more people involved. And it's, we've seen it getting traction over the years, so I'm pretty confident that this is the state we'll end up in two to three years from now. I wish also to see more um, you know, base tooling around Cardano, right? A lot of toolings really came up recently on how do you interact with the chain, how do you, you know, get set up on Cardano, get started. And, um, you know, in a few years from now, I wish that anyone could really start this, you know, famous, this hello world we're discussing uh, in maybe just a few minutes, right? So that would be, that would be cool. Oh, awesome. That about does it for us up here. I want to thank you all so much for taking your time to share your thoughts. And I look forward to everything that's going to happen in Cardano's open source ecosystem. And I wish you all the best of luck with your projects. Let's take a selfie for uh, social media. There you go. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Take care.